all these positions, which includes the president of DOS, the member scientific committee of AIOS, and of course, our own uh, vice president, who is uh, a wonderful clinician, a great surgeon, and a very good teacher. Rajiv? We can't hear you, Rajiv. Is it okay now? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Professor Titial doesn't need an introduction, but I'll just have to complete the formalities. Uh, an excellent person, very approachable, down to earth, and uh, with a person with a golden heart. He's the head and uh, professor and head of cornea and cataract refractive services at RP Center Ames, New Delhi. His uh, numerous publications and a huge experience in the field of phacoemal segregation, cornea, and refractive surgery has a plethora of awards uh, and uh, orations. Uh, all over the country uh, towards his name. He's the first Indian to have performed life cataract surgery at ASCRS and is the, has been awarded with the most coveted Padma Shri from the Government of India by the President of India. And without his support, Iskaris probably wouldn't have risen to this height. His support as well as his uh, uh, you know, suggestions and uh, guidelines that he keeps giving us from time to time. Rajesh. And uh, soon he's going to become the Chief of RP Center and we are going to have the Master Class of Professor Tityal sir. Then uh, amongst the panelists, we have Professor Namrata Sharma, who is the chairperson of Scientific Committee Iskaris, uh, working as professor of ophthalmology in the cornea, cataract, and refractive surgery services at RP Center Ames. He is the secretary of AIOS, the regional secretary of Asia Pacific Academy. Uh, she is secretary of IBank Association of India, has numerous publications and many awards to her credit various books and various multiple chapters. So as far as publication is concerned, she is known uh, uh, for this. And of course, uh, for teaching the undergraduates and postgraduates. Apart from that, she is definitely a very extremely hardworking and a very dynamic chairperson of the scientific committee of East Coast. Dr. Amrish Dharat, the medical director of Vision Next Foundation I in Pune. Is a prolific refractive surgeon with more than 20 years of experience and has presented numerous papers internationally and nationally and is an avid film producer. And knowing him at a personal level, it's really a pleasure. Welcome, Dr. Darak. Yeah, Dr. Amrish Darak has contributed a lot for his career, has organized various meetings. We also have with us Dr. Anjum uh, Mazari, who is currently Senior Consultant and Head Cornea Ocular Surface and Refractive Surgery Services at the Indira Gandhi Eye Hospital and Research Center. And his area of interest is, of course, refractive surgery in cornea and cataract. He has numerous achievements. A few I have noted here. He has received the India 100 Top MSME Award in the year 2020, India Signature Brands Award in Ophthalmology category, and Healthcare Excellence Award in 2019-2020, Primetime Global Icon Award, Achievement Award from Site Life USA for doing the highest number of corneal transplant surgery as an individual surgeon in India in 2015. And he was the first surgeon to perform pure toric phakic eye for astigmatism only. And he is a very prolific refractive surgeon. So we welcome Dr. Anjum Mazari. Dr. Mohak Shah is the director of Specs Eye Care Laser Private Center at Ahmedabad. Uh, Surat Udaipur and Pune and Relax Miles Center. He's a gold medalist uh, at MBBS and MS Ophthalmologist. He was working as a LASIK specialist consultant at uh, Dheeraj Hospital uh, Vahogdia, executive member of All Gujarat Ahmedabad Ophthalmological Society since the last three years, and is awarded as the youngest ophthalmologist to perform maximum number of LASIK surgeries in a year, year by Carl Zeiss for, uh, in the year 2012-2013. He has experience of more than 25,000 patients for refractive procedure. He's a regular speaker at various forums. I welcome Dr. Shah to this session. And with me is my co-moderator, the treasurer of Iskaras, Dr. Rajiv Mukherjee, who is the director and senior consultant, Mukherjee Eye Clinic, New Delhi. He is also the visiting professor at Feinberg School of Medicine, Northwestern University, Chicago, USA, an established cornea and phaco surgeon has presented many papers and courses at international and national level. He's also the vice chairman of ABS AIOS and a wonderful friend. And he's always there whenever we need him, whenever we need his help. And I'm Dr. Rajesh Sinha, uh, Honorary General Secretary, Iskaris, and working as professor in the cornea, lens, and refractive surgery services at RP Center Ames. So with this, uh, before we actually start the class, the wonderful class that we are going to have, 
We are going to learn all about refractive procedure, how things have evolved. By Professor Tatyal Sir, who is, an, who is such a prolific refractive surgeon, has done almost everything in refractive procedures. We would like to have comments from our chairperson of the session today, Dr. Rishi Mohan. So, Rishi Mohan, sir, please. Sir, you are muted, sir. You are mute. Thanks, Rajesh. And uh, I must thank you and the team uh, at ISKRIS uh, with Dr. Namrata and Rajiv and uh, everyone in the background, Anil and Bageshwar, for uh, you know, uh, continuing with this wonderful uh, series of learning from the masters. And I think we had a wonderful uh, session last week and uh, over the, sorry, two weeks ago. And uh, we are looking forward to, uh, to our president and uh, you know, uh, the incoming RPC chief as well, uh, Professor Titial, who's gonna give us a, a wonderful talk, I'm sure, on the evolution of refractive surgery. Um, uh, Jeevan has been at the forefront of, uh, of refractive surgery ever since it started. And I think he's been the, uh, I'd say, the torchbearer uh, for refractive surgery at the RP Center. And he's, uh, he's actually helped it evolve. And it is his contribution and the team at RP Center that has actually helped it evolve internationally because of the contributions uh, that you have made to the database uh, from which we have all learned. So uh, I'm, I'm so happy that uh, Professor Titial is going to be giving us this masterclass today. And I'm sure we'll, we'll come away with uh, lots of wonderful ideas and tips. And uh, I'm looking very, very much uh, uh, forward to this presentation. Thank you, sir. And now I'll request uh, uh, my teacher to teach once again the nuances of refractive surgery, uh, all about how it has evolved. Titial, sir. Yeah. <clears throat> Good evening to all of you and uh, thank you uh, Rishi for uh, such a wonderful introduction to the subject and uh, I don't think I deserve uh, so many you know, accolades at this juncture because uh, things evolved in RP Center because of a uh, lot of efforts by my seniors. In fact, uh, they were the pillars to RP Center. Today we are there because of them only. And thankful to the institution who has given us such an opportunity. And thank you, Rajesh and uh, Rajiv, for you know getting this uh, session. Let's hope uh, refractive surgery evolves in a in a such a standard across India that we gain something out of uh, learning from everybody. I think we all do refractive surgery, and it is our uh, basically to uh, practice which is going to help other people. As uh, has been told that topic today is to look into what is the present status of laser refractive corneal procedures across the world, in, including India. India is in the forefront of refractive surgery as such. And <clears throat> taking us uh, to an extent of knowing what has happened in our last century, in fact, looking into a refractive surgery, no financial disclosure from my side. And just look into the history wise, I think it is around 1930 where uh, we started with uh, radial keratotomy, which was a Japanese uh, surgeon, uh, Sumato Sato, who started doing an incisional keratotomy uh, through endothelial site and epithelial site to uh, correct the myopia in a Japanese soldier. And it was uh, really a remarkable uh, correction of those people and they served the you know, country uh, Japan as such. But I think if you look into a laser refractive procedure subsequently and the flap based procedure, it was uh, Jose Baraka who started uh, a keratome to do a basically keratomyelosis in 1960s. And subsequently that led, led us to a, a flap making procedures. And the first PRK, which uh, was done uh, subsequently in the uh, 1980s, uh, like the PTK was done by Theo Saylor earlier, but it was uh, subsequent uh, Margaret McDonald who uh, published the first results on PRK in 1987. And in 1990, uh, Palikaris uh, was a person who started uh, LASIK and that changed the uh, concept of laser refractive procedure amongst the young people uh, across the world. And subsequently in 2003 or 2000, in fact, 99, it was approved by FDA uh, procedure. 
And you can see femtosecond lasers subsequently uh, came into a refractive practice. And in 2003, it was approved uh, for a LASIK flap making in these cases. So in fact, this was femtosecond and uh, examined laser uh, combined procedure. In 2008, we had a single uh, uh, example uh, femtosecond laser procedure called uh, small incisional lenticle extraction approved by FDA in uh, subsequently 2016. If you see this entire chart of uh, refractive surgery evolution, today we don't have incisional refractive surgery. That means that surgery could not sustain the uh, subsequent change in era of evolution because it had a lot of complications. And subsequently, uh, we still have to manage those complications with patients undergoing incisional surgery in India in, uh, in millions. So these patients are going to come with uh, either uh, trauma to the cornea or they can have cataract, which has a lot of difficulties in getting back to an optimal visual after cataract surgery also because of distorted corneal anatomy and the is refractive status as such. But if you see here, we started with surface ablation then shifted to a flap based uh, LASIK procedure. Now we have a smile or refractive lenticular stretch. All three are still first generation, second generation, and third generation are still being practiced across the world. That means the laser refractive procedures were up to the mark right from in its inception until date, they are being continued. So we are going to discuss all three of them today and see how we do these procedures and what are the complications we do see in these cases and how do we manage? So we also some of the you know, important complication management and highlight the uh, other uh, complications which are very, very rare in the laser refractive procedure in the cornea, which is the good thing for all of us. And the outcomes are uh, one of the best possible in terms of predictability in a human body uh, surgery wise. So this is how we have evolved now today. We are based on a, basically a few of the indices which come from a, a tomography or a biomechanical uh, indices which we get from a, a instrument like Corbis, which can give you a various uh, factors. So if you look at tomographic ways, you have a D value or you have a, 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 a biomagnetic indices, which can be because of Corbis or you have a, a tomography biomagnetic indices. These three things are, uh, I think, important for us today to exclude uh, cases of a subclinical uh, keratoconus. If you have a frank keratoconus, then uh, you can't do a refractive procedure in a normal uh, looking cornea. Th those will come in abnormal cornea. For them, you have a different procedures. So if you have a normal D value, normal uh, corvus biomechanical indices, or you have a tomography value, which are normal, so we can proceed with a corneal refractive procedure, which can be, as I said, which can be a surface, which can be LASIK, or which can be SMILE. So let me take you through the first procedure that is a surface ablation and PRK is the one which is uh, commonly being practiced across the world in a large magnitude. And uh, the most important thing is to remove the epithelium appropriately of a desired size and leaving the uh, surface smooth so that you can do an examine laser ablation subsequently. So we can do a spatula that is a mechanical remover, or you can use a blade like epilastic, or you can use a rotatory brush epiclear type of procedures where you can remove the epithelium without causing the uh, damage associated with alcohol, which is people are described as an apoptosis happening to the subsequent uh, epithelial uh, cell regeneration in these cases. Or nowadays we are shifted to a trans epithelial uh, PRK with the examined laser as a single uh, step procedure in these cases. This, this is what uh, we are looking for, the importance of knowing PRK giving us the uh, less depth of laser ablation so that you have a larger uh, corneal tissue is there. So you're going to have a much better biomechanically uh, uh, stronger cornea in these cases. So maybe you'll have a lesser chances of ectasia in these cases. So we know that ectasia has been reported after PRK also. Most importantly, we are not going to have a flap related complication, which are uh, quite significant in a, a flap for surgeries like elastic. The only problem is that the recovery can be slow and sometimes especially for higher refractive corrections. You have a patient who's had a little painful uh, period subsequently, which is uh, unlike elastic. 
and <clears throat> looking for a epithelial healing which sometimes can be compromised in these cases which may lead into epithelial defect and subsequent other problems also <clears throat> So today we are bound to do a epithelial mapping for all cases we are undergoing a surface ablation or PRK, not only to decide on the thickness you are going to remove with the laser, with the PTK mold. Also, it gives you an idea of irregular thickening uh, cases. If you see this particular case here, it has a uniform thickness, 50, 50, 53, not much of an alternation. So this is a good case for trans epithelial uh, PRK as such. And if you see this uh, case here has already thickened epithelium. So if you take just 50 as you know standard in these cases, they're going to have a very irregular epithelial uh, removal. And your subsequent laser ab ablation may not give you adequate uh, correction. You can have under correction in these cases. So maybe these cases are all right for a mechanical removal or alcohol assisted epithelial removal as such. So this is what uh, we do nowadays, trans epithelial PRK. So first we do a PTK mode epithelial removal, which if you take a 50 as an epithelial thickness, it can give you a 7.5 millimeter uh, diameter of uh, epithelial removal, which is uh, good enough for a refractive surface subsequently examined laser ablation. So this particular uh, uh, examined laser assisted uh, de-epithelization de takes slightly uh, longer time but subsequent examined laser ablation is uh, very fast in these cases. You can see we already have removed the epithelium here, right from center. This is a totally unedited uh, video. You can see the time consumed is uh, around a minute. You can remove the debris. Subsequently, you can apply the examined laser as per the correction. This also gives a good uh, guideline for uh, if you want to do a uh, topo guided treatment also, this will be a better way. Subsequently, I, we do apply mitomycin C, 0.02%. People have a different algorithm for our amount of uh, mitomycin C duration application. My guideline is around uh, 14 seconds per diopter. That can be 10, 10 seconds to 20 seconds, depending on the amount of refractive error you are going to correct in these cases. This is our, our, my old video where you can see here uh, alcohol assisted uh, surgery, which is called LASIK, or where we used to retain the epithelium after removal. So we used to make a little uh, mark on the corneal epithelium of uh, 8.5 to 9, 8.5 millimeter. Subsequently, take a, a well where we used to put a 20% alcohol for around 20 seconds uh, to be placed, which is beyond the little bit of uh, the mark we have given into the epithelium with the trifine here, so that you can easily peel off uh, the epithelium. But now we understand uh, preserving the uh, epithelial flap is not very important. And we sacrifice the epithelium nowadays. And subsequent publication, we have also published that if you retain epithelium or don't retain, uh, retain epithelium, hardly makes a difference in the outcome in terms of epithelial healing or a refractive outcome as such. In fact, if you remove the epithelium, your uh, subsequent epithelialization is faster and the painful period is also less. You can see how gently we remove the entire epithelium from the uh, area of subsequent marking onto the uh, epithelium here. So once you remove the entire epithelium, we can do a, a surface ablation with examined laser. And once you do the examined laser, either you can replace the flap back, which will uh, totally you know, uh, cover the uh, ablated area. Or if you feel your epithelium is not uh, good enough, you can uh, sacrifice the epithelium as we are doing here. And uh, in that way, subsequently, we can put a contact lens. Nowadays, the practice is to uh, soak the contact lens for at least 30 minutes in a uh, acular LS type of solution, which has a diclofenic. And uh, the pain subsequently in these cases will be less. So that is what is the standard period. Uh, if you use uh, NSAID uh, soaked uh, contact lenses, the chances of pain and uh, recovery is faster in these cases. So that is a standard procedure. People do a uh, PRK right from the minor correction to even up to uh, 10 diopters. But as far as we are concerned, we don't go beyond the six diopters and cylindrical correction uh, around 1.5 to two diopter in these cases. These are various uh, complications which we might see in these cases. Most importantly, we are looking for is the haze, 
which may happen after PRK. In fact, that is the uh, concern for uh, all of us, which are uh, who are exactly uh, you know uh, flab based surgeons to begin with to shift to PRK. We know that there are surgeons who do only PRK for their case. So haze can be early haze, which is within the first three months of a surgery, and these this haze normally goes away with your treatment, especially with uh, steroid therapy in these cases. But the late haze, which comes after a few months of surgery or a few years after surgery, that can cause uh, serious uh, visual uh, disturbances because that uh, can cause decreased contrast and visual acuity can go down and can increase the higher order aberrations. And the treatment can be difficult for those cases. The recommended uh, treatment for our cases with haze is first prophylactic, which we talked about uh, in these cases. And mainly we see these uh, uh, complication in a higher refractive correction, like we have said here, more than six diapter correction in these cases, more than three diapter cylindrical corrections. Hyperopia is, has a more chances of uh, haze developing. The younger patient, male patients, and other immuno, immune deficiency disease in these cases, in these cases. Subsequent UV, UV exposure is another important factor for these cases. So we might advise these people to wear a UV protective glasses, which may decrease the late onset haze in these cases. Typically, uh, if you have late onset uh, haze, then you have to use a mitomycin C in these cases. And uh, that may be uh, people use for a very, very long period. So you can range from two minutes to uh, 15 to 20 minutes, depending on the haze and recurrence happening in these cases. And uh, you have to assess these patients uh, subsequently. And the haze doesn't go off immediately. It might take a few months sometimes to recovery to happen in these patients to uh, extent of vision which they may require. There are such, some cases where you may have to do a uh, secondary procedure, like a PTK can be done with mitomycin C. Or you can do a, a, a superficial lamellar keratoplasty in cases where you have a deep uh, haze, which is not uh, going away with your uh, mitomycin C application. So Rajesh, uh, this is uh, my first uh, you know, uh, surface thing. Uh, if we can discuss this part, because then I'll shift to the elastic part here. Rishi? Thank you, sir. Uh, any any comment from the panelists at this point of time? Because well, I think, uh, uh, what uh, Jeevan has said is absolutely fantastic. And he's highlighted uh, a few points at this level itself. Uh, one is that uh, the corneal indices and epithelial mapping has come in in our uh, you know pre-operative assessment, and that has uh, overtaken the conventional methodology that we used to use. And I think corneal biomechanics has finally, uh, even though I've been uh, talking about it for uh, 13, 14 years, it's now finally entered mainstream evaluation of a of a pre-refractive uh, uh, candidate. The second thing with regards to PRK, I think what uh, Jeevan has said very rightly is about the haze prevention mechanisms and uh, about the use of MMC and sometimes pre and post-operative steroids and uh, about the use of a contact lens, which is now soaked in an NSAID. He highlighted that. And even though we used to use uh, uh, Acular, but that's not available anymore. And uh, that used to be a perfect product for this. And it was coming in a preservative free fashion. And uh, also uh, he's mentioned about how he uses uh, the titrates, the amount of MMC <clears throat> based on the diopteric power that he's treating. And I think these are very valuable suggestions and very valuable points. And uh, I'd be happy for, to hear from the other panelists. I think we can take the, you know, uh, Amris can talk about, he does a lot of PR case. Amris, your opinion Amrish. on... I think Dr. Mohak Sa wanted to say okay, something. Okay, Mohak, yeah. Yeah. Mohak, Mohak, yeah. Yes, sir. First of all, excellent presentation, sir. Uh, so regarding the NSEID available, I think uh, Entod is having it. I'm using it quite, uh, you know, regularly right now. It is known as the AccuSaid. So it is just the same mm -hmm. way we are using the Endergan one. And I'm getting the very good results. The patient's pain complaint has been markedly reduced. Also, the haze I am seeing is there is not much of haze. But uh, I would like to know, sir, what is the limit of refraction you would like to do for this PRK? Because there are a couple of group of people, you know, they also say you can do it up to minus 10 and all. But I personally prefer only up to minus 5. So I'd like to have your view on that, sir, first. 
Yeah, I did uh, did say that you know we uh, restrict ourselves to a lower degree of uh, refractive error. Uh, I've gone up to uh, minus four, minus four point five max in uh, cases, and cylinder also I don't go more than one point five in these cases. And hyperopia, I've never done PRK because it's very difficult to predict uh, results in PRK in those cases, and uh, they have a very high chances of uh, developing uh, uh, haze uh, immediately post op also. So, uh, though it gives a larger area of uh, ablation uh, possible because flap making can be difficult in hyperopia sometimes, but uh, looking into a haze happening in these cases is a major concern because the ablation is much more uh, than uh, a routine uh, exam laser for a myopic patients. So, my uh, people, you rightly said, people go up to ten diopter myopia, which is and up to three diopter cylinder, which is approved uh, as such. And uh, with the use of mitomycin, uh, people have uh, good results, and the incidence of uh, haze coming up is so less. Uh, it can range, you know, 0.1 to uh, 3 percent, depending on the scenarios. With the use of a newer generation examiner laser, the things have uh, do totally changed because the energy used and uh, is quite less. So that also uh, is an important factor. And the healing will also change with the you know, type of uh, laser energy you use in your patients. So I think two things. One is uh, the newer generation examiner lasers. Second is the use of uh, adjuvant treatment like a mitomycin C has changed the you know, perception of various surgeons now. Can I add something? Sure, yeah, sure, sir. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, actually, in the in this kind of plant PRK case, we usually do three things. Before doing the posterior, we take the correct dry eye estimation. And do intra-op, intra we develop a technique. If, if sometime next time or at the time I will show the technique. If it helps your excess technique, we avoid touching the bowman. No rubbing at bowman, bowman. It will give a wonderful effect post-operatively. And secondly, in the post-op, during, during the post-op, we give saclos for aid. And it's major squat for six weeks, then minor squat for four weeks more. Okay, Plus I think that's a good, good point. I, I, I just wanted to have a discussion of post-op treatment regimes of various people. Because uh, if you are doing a PRK, uh, once you have a epithelial healing, then you can start a steroid uh, in a uh, higher frequency in these cases. People like to wait for uh, sometimes epithelium to heal because that's a major concern for uh, all surface ablation patients. And subsequently, either you have a light uh, steroid for a long term, or a shift, as you rightly said, shift to a NSAID uh, or a uh, cyclosporine type of uh, drug for a long period. Especially if you are correcting a higher refractive error. The steroid uh, dosing has to be titrated in that direction, and uh, people use one drop of, uh, you know, uh, steroid for a very, very long time in a you know, PRK patients. Sir, as we are discussing about PRK, a couple of questions have come up. Uh, one question is that what's your experience of regression in PRK and what guidelines you use to retreat these patients and what's the ideal time to retreat? Rajesh, uh, as far as regression is concerned, it is only seen in a higher uh, uh, range of refractive corrections. Whatever refractive correction we have done for a less than uh, four diopters, the chance of regression is quite less in these cases. In fact, they do very well uh, with PRK. And if they have a regression, like any refractive procedure, first you have to make sure your uh, corneal parameters, that is tomographic parameters, as well as refractive parameters are stabilized. As rightly pointed out doctor by Dr. Anjum, your surface has to be absolutely fine. Dry eye has to be assessed. Tear film has to be assessed in these cases. Once I feel the refractive and cornea parameters are stabilized for a, at least for a three months, then we go for a second uh, uh, treatment. And the chances of haze in a second treatment is much higher than a primary treatment. Yeah. So that you have to explain to your patient carefully. And then uh, go ahead with the thing and maybe the mitomycin C use has to be slightly longer than a standard uh, your primary case and subsequently the use of steroids has to be for longer period in these cases in the post-op period. Uh, Dr. Mohak wants to uh, ask something. Uh, Dr. Mohak, please go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, what is this, sir, your preferred method for the removal of the epithelium? Because nowadays, you know, people are coming with the trans-PRK 
I know it is limited to the one particular platform, but even on the size, we have the size band 90, and I am doing it in a two-step mode, and I am getting good results. So your view on that, sir? And the same work you rightly pointed yeah. out. We also do in a, both the systems. We do have a wave light as well as uh, mel 90, and uh, both do a excellent uh, work, and we have results are quite uh, okay. But as I said, uh, the epithelial mapping is very, very important. Uh, if my epithelial mapping is regular, especially in uh, you know, the area of concern, which is around 5 to 7 millimeter, if the epithelial thickness doesn't go beyond the, uh, the difference between the center to periphery is more than four, 5 microns, then that is acceptable. If the difference between uh, the lo lowest thickness and highest thickness is more than 5 microns, then it's a difficult case for you. And I do uh, consider doing a manual uh, epithelial removal in those cases where you, you have a larger difference in epithelial thickness from a thinness to thickness. But uh, routinely we are doing a trans epithelial nowadays because uh, uh, faster and uh, you know, simpler procedure. Uh, I, I don't have to use alcohol for these patients. Yes, and the second thing is, is the speed of the excimer laser related to the haze development because wavelight works on 500 hertz and MEN90 has this dual speed. Which, which works well on the 250 hertz or your view on that, sir. Another panel is also. No, no, I think uh, speed will make a difference. Uh, you'll have a faster uh, uh, ablation in these cases. <clears throat> but whatever uh, cases we have done, there has been no significant, any difference in the outcome wise. So I would say uh, rather than looking for you, definitely if you have a, a 500 uh, hertz, uh, hertz or a, uh, you have a the other one, the energy uh, delivered will be less with the, you know, the more, uh, you can say, uh, speed-wise also. So you have a lesser chances of uh, uh, adjoining tissue damage in these cases. So results will be little, uh, should be better. But uh, till date, I don't think we have a comparative study in these two uh, cases. I think we'll uh, come out with the results of our cases very soon. And we'll see how it effectively it makes a difference the only consideration for us, you know, in uh, cases uh, with MEL90, your area of epithelial removal is little smaller than uh, cases with uh, wave light. So sometimes if you have to do a larger uh, treatment zone, then it's a consideration there. I guess this is a question for which you have already answered. That is your experience on trans -AP. PRK visa V conventions. So you already answered that question. Okay, let's just go to the next session. Then we can have a further discussion. Yeah. Okay, uh, let me shift to the you know, LASIK, which is the, I think, the one of the most common uh, corneal uh, laser procedure being done uh, to correct refractive errors. The two things are important. One is a microcarotome uh, for a making flap, because that is the most important step, uh, which is different from the surface ablation. Or we can use a femtosecond laser to create the flap in these cases. You have to put it in the slideshow, I think it's... Oh, yeah, sorry. I... Thank you, Namita. Uh, so this is what I'm going to take you through the uh, microkeratomes, uh, how they have evolved. As I, in the beginning, I talked about uh, Jose Barakar uh, uh, developing the keratome for you know, subsequent refractive procedures. So basically, we have a very high precision oscillating blade system, which is uh, working onto the suction ring, which is docked onto the uh, corneal limbus to create a, a thin corneal uh, lamellar uh, flap with uniform thickness possible uh, without uh, creating the irregularity in the flap making these cases. The first uh, keratome uh, which came was a translational or a linear microkeratome which used to make a nasal hinge. And subsequently we had a rotating systems which gives a superior hinge like a pivoting uh, uh, keratomes. And now we have a disposable systems, single use microkeratomes uh, to decrease the uh, you can say uh, chances of epithelium uh, getting into the flap if you use for a multiple patient. These are our various uh, available uh, microkeratones for us, which gives you a different hinge position. Mainly we are looking for superior. If you're looking to a Moria or a M2, they can be placed anywhere in 360 degrees. You can make flap as per your uh, requirements. But it's important to look into our various sizes available uh, of uh, section ring, which, because some Asian eyes will have a smaller uh, aperture. 
So you can see 8.5 uh, to 9.5 range, depending on uh, aperture and the limbus uh, wide to wide diameter in this case. Other important thing is the how uh, would be the head sizes. You can see here, they are ranging from the 120 microns to 180 microns. And today's contest, I think uh, it is important to have a keratome uh, head size can give you 120, 110, or up to 140 as such. But what about uh, looking for a thinner uh, flaps, which can be a sub or 90 micron flaps in a, a newer generation systems. So these pendular uh, blades uh, can give you a nice uh, flap making, which can range from 90 microns to 170 microns. And the hinge position can be selected as per the patient's characteristic. So they're very high speed, you know, 15,000 uh, speed uh, with these blades and within three uh, millimeter per second is the speed in these cases. So this is what uh, we used to do earlier. We have not used uh, keratome, uh, microkeratome for last uh, more than a decade now. The last time we used was around uh, 2008, I think 2008 or 10. So this is the Hansetome uh, XP, which is again uh, a pivotal type of uh, keratome, which will uh, rotate uh, through this area. This is the area of uh, uh, keratome head to be placed on a suction ring. We used to get a different sizes of suction ring, 18 and 20 millimeter. Once you make a flap, uh, subsequently ablation can be done. So many of our uh, residents or trainees have not seen this uh, surgery. So this video is very, very, important for me to you know show them like this is the peripheral mark which you make uh, you should make three marks uh, this is the rk uh, marker in fact optical zone marker it's a 20 millimeter suction ring which will give you a 8.5 millimeter uh, flap and uh, this is the uh, holder uh, where the keratome head will get uh, placed wet your cornea most importantly to see the intraocular pressure is of sufficient uh, amount if you have a Less, in, you can see this is the tonometer. The, the uh, contact area should be smaller than the uh, this ring. Once you place the uh, uh, keratome head onto the socket, then it will move subsequently. The, uh, the movement goes like the blade moves uh, in circular manner. And the suction generator in this system used to be go very, very high, which may range up to almost uh, 160 to 200 millimeter mercury which is uh, quite long. And the surgery time for making flap is to be uh, quite as uh, longer, especially if you have a difficulty in uh, rotating your blade. Once you remove the flap, this is what you see. People were dilated because of pressure. It's come down to normal size. So you have an intact ring here. You can lift the flap now. This is a flap lifter. And this is normally used to be a 120 uh, to 140 flap. This looks like a 120 flap here. And subsequently make a laser. And the centration of uh, your uh, flap making is very, very important uh, as such because you are making a thicker and deeper flap making, which also will have importance. And the shape of the flap is a little different than what you normally see in a femtosecond laser. So once you ablate the entire area, you can uh, wash off the debris and subsequently replace the flap. Make sure your ring is absolutely uh, correct. This will avoid the, the flap uh, this orientation, which may happen sometimes in these cases. And normally in those days, we used to wait at least one to two minutes for a flap to get adhered because the adherence of a peripheral area will be different in a microkeratome flap making access. So these are a femtosecond devices which came subsequently and you have a various companies which gives you a opportunity to do a, a predictable flap making for a subsequent exam laser ablation in these cases. And they have all changed from a starting with a 15 kilohertz system in interlace. Now they have 150 kilohertz. And if you look into a uh, femto uh, GEMA, it has a five megahertz, uh, which is a significantly the latest generation system, which gives you a very high frequency and low pulse energy uh, to the you know, cornea, which will give you a chance of making a 90 micron flap in these cases. And uh, Energy delivered will be so less with high frequency, low pulse energy. You have a very nice outcome happening in these cases. So femtosecond uh, lasers also evolved for a flap making uh, in, a, in the last one or two decades. And this is a basically uh, the procedure which you make here. The first we make a pocket 
So this will allow the subsequent uh, bubble to escape and have a nice smoother uh, bed making and the side kit uh, will give us a, a chance of making a good nice linear cut <clears throat> and side cut uh, also you can change the angle uh, of the side cut also you can make a 90 degree 110 degree depending on a, your choice and flap is lifted very very effectively in these cases and the flap addition is much better much faster than a micro in these cases this is one uh, video or recorder is not very good just now, so a little hazy. So once you have a good centration and your laser has been uh, calibrated, you can put a suction there. This is suction one. So once then you can place the application cone uh, onto the cone. Make sure your uh, application is well centered to the pupil here. So once you have a good application here, this is a section two. We had a canal formation, which takes around 40% of energy uh, to be, and next 60% is making the flap and side cut. You can just make a peripheral opening, and subsequently you can see how effectively uh, you can lift the flap uh, without any difficulty with uh, these uh, newer generation uh, systems. And how smooth is the flap, uh, as well as the bed in these cases. Ablation is also very faster. Flap making uh, is very fast with the uh, which are new devices we, are, we have been using. Well, uh, we use uh, WaveLight or are we using the Bizumex also for flap making in today's scenario as well. The flap can be uh, put back like you see in other videos. So it is important first to make sure your flap is uh, nicely attached. And this is a very important side. Once you put a, uh, you can uh, sponge here, you should see uh, this ring formation all around. It should be uniform. So that indicates your flap is nicely attached without having a decentration happening or a folds. And before you take with the patient, see the patient under the microscope and see that there's uh, not much of a deviation in the fold or in the flap. There are no folds, no interface debris or a fallen body, which is very important. And always tell your patient not to touch your eye for at least for 24 hours. And drops should be put also without touching the eyes also. So this is what I was talking about. In, if you look into a precision and predictability, both are good, femtosecond as well as microcatome. But yes, femtosecond will have more predictability and it will give you a better a planar flap than a meniscal flap you see in uh, cases with uh, uh, keratome induced. You have a starting little ragged, then you have a little more thickness, central is thinner. So this gives a meniscal type of flap. So definitely it's going to induce some sort of uh, higher order abrasion uh, in these cases, which you know, would be uh, difficult to compensate with the examined laser, which is being done in a, uh, the bed, which is also not regular. Well, if you see femtosecond uh, flap, very smooth uh, planar flap. The induction of uh, higher order abrasion is less in these cases. And you have a higher chances of predictable uh, cal pre op calculation of a PTA, which is very important, you know, borderline corneal thickness where you are totally depend on, dependent on your pre-op calculation for these cases. And efficacy, accuracy, safety is uh, quite okay in terms of visual outcome with a microcaratome uh, LASIK or a femtosecond LASIK in these cases. Similarly, the quality of vision seems to be better with the femtosecond, as I said, uh, lesser hydro or abrasion induction with uh, these flaps as such. Complications, uh, femtosecond will have lesser flap related complications, though we still see a uh, complication in these cases also. More importantly, people should talk about transient light sensitivity syndrome, which is decreased now with the newer generation femtosecond lasers. And DLK also is, I have not seen in my life. <clears throat> so that's a change which has happened with the initial uh, you know, 30 kilohertz or uh, uh, 50 or now 150 uh, intralase. Things have changed so much. Macrocaratome assisted uh, LASIK, the same complication is still be there depending on a type of uh, cornea you are dealing with, a type of patient you are dealing with, and do have a chances of a problem. These two things, cavitation, air bubble, and the OBL is classically seen uh, only with the femtosecond data. OBL actually doesn't make a difference in terms of outcome wise, but if your OBL crosses the uh, pupillary zone, then things can be a little difficult in these cases. Your results can be a little unpredictable. Well, bubbles in intracameral bubbles uh, sometimes can uh, you know, make your uh, tracking system uh, ineffective. So you have to approach in a different manner in these cases. 
Classically, you can have a buttonhole, which is seen with the macular keratome, but in femtosecond, you can have a vertical uh, gas breakthrough. Like this is one of my case where you can see this uh, area, the laser has come out uh, through the epithelium. If you see an OCT, this is immediately a uh, post-op uh, this case. You can see a very nice planar flap is being made, which is around 108, 110. See here, uh, there's a break, uh, breakthrough happening in this case. So in such cases, you have to wait for some time, maybe uh, around uh, six to eight weeks, then go either with PRK or you can go a little thicker or deeper uh, flap making these cases. Examiner laser, uh, I think we should know a little bit. Uh, we have started with, you know, uh, physics uh, summit uh, laser. Then we had a broad beam laser with a fixed optical zones. And now subsequently you had a broad beam with a variable optical zones with a multi-zone treatment. And then came the flying spot, uh, which changed the entire concept of uh, getting a good uh, uh, reflective outcome in these patients with the tracker built in. And subsequently you could do a customized ablation for your patients in the fifth generation. And now we have a sixth generation, which is the fastest ablation rate, faster tracking, and with all advanced ablation profile, most importantly, it takes care of a cyclotrochnal and the control uh, which can be there in, uh, during the actual uh, putting a laser spot in these cases. So this has changed the predictability for your case. But this is one study where they compare various available uh, exam and laser uh, modules, but the outcomes are almost uh, within the uh, prerequisite of uh, FDA guidelines for all types of lasers. Complication, we all know, we can have intra, early post-op and late post-op complications. And few of them I would like to highlight. One is uh, we're looking at a flap-based procedure. Basically, we can see a flap dislocation, a flap avulsion, flap tear, stire, which is common. Epithelial ingrowth, uh, interface-related problems, or uh, sometimes scarring or a foreign body, eyelashes getting into the interface. They have to be seen carefully and uh, taken care of. This can be extreme of a complication, having a you know, infective uh, element in the flap after LASIK, uh, which is, can be devastating. This is one complication which can be vision threatening for our patients. Epithelial in growth, if reaches the optical zone, the things can be difficult. You have to manage. Stria is uh, managed quite effectively. You can have a, a very high uh, severity of uh, stria. Normally, these are seen a patient coming late in a post-op period and patient vision uh, is not uh, checked by a patient daily. Sometimes you can have this type of fold, which is very difficult to uh, correct. Thinner the flap, you have more chances of stry in these cases. So this is one of my patients. You can see uh, this was uh, in the first post-op day. Looking at that, you can have stry, which normally comes from the hinge area, and it is normally uh, uh, vertically oriented and goes towards the inferior areas. So this is a classical picture of uh, orientation. So you, if you have patient coming early or you have patient coming late, so you can have a flap stire seen immediately after surgery in a straight climb examination. You should take the patient immediately back to uh, your examiner laser OR, refloat the flap and make sure your flap is nicely attached. Sometimes you can give contact lens to these patients uh, so that the retention of flap addition is better. So if you see the patient within first 24 hours, so this is what I'm going to see. So you uh, all, this is the nicely uh, seen flap. I've taken this patient to main OR and dilated people so that we can appreciate the folds better. So if you just do a, uh, at this time, which is uh, massaging, it's not going to work because epithelial uh, healing is so fast into these folds. Even within 24 hours, you have to divide the epithelium, but totally in these cases. The only difference in a early post-op is sometimes you may not have to lift the flap to correct this uh, fold which has occurred. If you just remove the epithelium, it will release the, the pressure between the folds and you can uh, iron out the entire flap. You can see flap size, the folds are still there. So once you do a subsequent massage, this will go off. But if you have patient coming after 48 hours or after one week, then those cases, apart from uh, removing the epithelium, you have to lift the flap and make sure you do ironing from anterior and both the inner surface and outer surface in these cases. The ironing should be either side, first downwards, then you have to iron out and sideways also. 
So this case worked out because it was within the first 24 hours. But later, you have to may have to hydrate the flap also with uh, saline so that uh, edema develops and you can iron out the you know uh, folds better. So in such cases, you have to be very very careful because vision can really go down subsequently. So this is one case uh, came to us uh, after almost uh, three years of a laser surgery. You can see this is the picture, clinical picture. You can see this is the flap, which is dislodged totally. And this is the ingrowth, which is there uh, behind the flap. And this was the original area of elastic uh, flap, which is now epithelized. This is a bare stroma, which has got epithelized now. And this is under retrognition. You can see totally dis dislodged now. You can see a fibrosed uh, retractor flap, and this is epithelial growth. The approach uh, in such cases uh, can be very difficult to explain to patient, and uh, people, uh, the panel can talk about subsequently how to uh, take care of this macrostia epithelial growth and the totally dislodged flap in these cases with the visual equity of this right eye in a post-op is very, very poor. And this is the, uh, you can see a uh, four quad map showing the uh, thickened epithelium here, which looks like an ectasia as such. But if you look into a, a, a profile in OCT here, this is the ingrowth, and this is the you know area of uh, normal flap, which is superior in this case. So just to show you this video, what uh, we approach in this patient. So this is the area where uh, the ingrowth is there inferiorly, and this is the area where flap is there. So I did a little bit of uh, epithelial uh, removal first because it is important to remove the epithelium all around. You can use alcohol also in these cases. Then make a, uh, with a Sinsky hook, I made a mark in the peripheral area. Then when inside the Sinsky you said, then lifted the entire dis disorganized flap right up to here. You can see this is the flap which is taken away. Now you can see this is the area of uh, epithelial ingrowth. In fact, the uh, superficial cornea is already you know, uh, devitalized here. I've done an amputation of uh, this distorted flap. Do a rexist type of procedure here. So this is the amputation. You can see the folds are also there in a bed also, small beds. And gentle removal of uh, Epithelial ingrowth, then use a mitomycin C uh, 0.02 uh, for at least for a one minute in this particular case. This was the end of surgery and put a bandage contact lens subsequently. You can see a smooth bed now. The epithelial ingrowth has been taken care of. And this patient did very well subsequently. This is the first post op day. The visual acuity from 624 uh, uncorrected, uh, corrected was 612. The pre-op vision was uh, 636 in this patient uh, corrected. IOP is normal. This is the, uh, you can see uh, quite better looking uh, topography with this patient in post-op period. And uh, this patient now after one month, I think after one month, the vision uncorrected is now uh, six, six parts, even after doing amputation also. And the wave front also has improved in this patient. So this is a, a patient where I felt we did not require to do a you know, lamellar procedure. Simply uh, removal of this disorganized flap did well for these cases. In growth uh, is seen quite commonly after LASIK, especially after relifting uh, for a retreatment subcase. This is one patient where we had a peripheral uh, epithelial in growth approaching the central area. This is a technique uh, we have learned from our seniors. Just depress the central cornea, the peripheral edge becomes uh, clear. And people mark this uh, area with a strictum also. Sometimes that is very difficult. Just central pressure makes the you know, edge of the flag very, very prominent and subsequently you can lift. If you have IOCT, that also helps you that you're in a proper plane uh, of dissection here. You can see I've removed the flag. So this is the area of epithelial growth, large one coming to the central area. I lifted partial flap only so that pupillary area is not distorted and remove the entire epithelial uh, in growth use uh, mitomycin C in this area only and uh, put the flap back. So this is what uh, benefits of uh, OCT if you have attached mic. So you can see better in these cases of flap making also. So I think we can have, you know, discussion uh, if uh, people want in the LASIK procedure before I shift to a smile, Dr. Namrata. Sir, I think uh, those were very nice, I wouldn't say a nice set of complications, but 
very well managed <laughs> cases uh, everybody can get into this catch 22 situation i think uh, uh, like uh, the slit lamp attachment which is present in some of the uh, uh, some of the laser machines also helps immediately uh, post i mean even before the patient uh, after doing immediately after doing the procedure because i think we have it in our machine also so that can help to see if the uh, uh, if the flap is pretty much attached and if they are although it will not delineate the stria so well because the reflexes are not yet there but that is something uh, which can also be done and i think the last case second last case was very well managed where the flap had to be amputated and i think that was the way it had to be tackled because there was no way the flap could have been saved but post operatively there was some amount of ectasia which was there in the center and although the visual acuity was 6 12 i did not catch what was the thickness there where the k was around 50s but i'm sure we need to watch these patients yeah, yeah you're right yeah. ectasia yeah you are absolutely correct uh, the thickness was uh, i think if i don't remember correctly around uh, 340 uh, in that particular case and uh, it was basically the epithelium which is you know so uh, hypertrophic which is giving us pre op like ectasia mm. post op that also decreased the keratomitic value has come down and after one month the uh, patient has improved a lot uh, we are waiting for a subsequent uh, this thing you are right uh, chances of ectasia is there in such cases but uh, there are people who might do a, you know uh, replace the you know flap with a Okay. like a flap based procedure okay. also especially so with you have uh, only described that replacement uh, of uh, so i thought uh, we can go for you know two stage procedure because this patient had uh, epithelial ingrowth and sometimes if you immediately put the flap the grow in growth can come up in these cases also but yes uh, you are right if if they are tends to come up then we can do a you know uh, flap based procedure subsequently also what is the refractive outcome of flap amputation in this particular case uh, it did uh, uh, improve subsequently the patient is now almost 6 six part with a correction and around 6 pair parts with naked eye after one month of uh, this procedure so i was surprised you know uh, if we remove the you know 120 140 flap which is uh, supporting the uh, uh, lasik procedure so even the that uh, would uh, contribute into a uh, some sort of a refractive correction as such but uh, in effect like if you look into a uh, uh, contact lens procedures uh, which you do it is the uh, good uh, epithelial uh, the tear film which is uh, important for uh, giving a good uh, refraction in these cases so if you have a smoother surface with the uh, appropriate tear film your patient might improve the uh, refractively also No, actually, uh, I have done few flap amputations for referred mm -hmm. cases, which come for various issues after refractive surgery. But the first question with the referring surgeon asked that, if, uh, doctor, if you remove the flap, what will do the refractive? Will it become myopic? Will the patient go hyperopic, or uh, will there be induced astigmatism? So, so what what is the answer that you would give in my shoes? Then the answer would be, I'll wait and see how it does. But you are right; the patient should become a hyperopic. Uh, Uh, after removing the flap, but all it all depends what is the residual uh, cornea in these cases, and what was the initial, you uh, know, uh, refractive correction uh, in these cases, and uh, and the subsequent healing which is going to happen. It will be very unpredictable healing. We are not sure, and uh, we'll have to wait and see. So, if if patient has less than three hundred micron thickness residual. Uh, the patient then i'm pretty sure i'll do a you know flap uh, uh, replacement type of surgery in this patient so that you improve the thickness and uh, rigidity of cornea if the cornea thickness is more than 350 microns uh, i'll go for a flap amputation see how patient does subsequently so it will depend on the, the thickness uh, available of cornea with you so if you have a corvish type of thing or you can do ora for these cases that will also give you a, what is the biomechanical uh, strength of the cornea then you can uh, subsequently titrate also um uh, just uh, uh, i think i i am in total agreement there but i think what uh, dr titial has clearly highlighted is that don't hesitate to amputate the flap if it comes to that uh, because some flaps are just not salvageable 
and uh, i think uh, most flaps i think nowadays which are created are largely optically planar so they may not impact your uh, optical outcome too much though yes there would be a mild uh, induction of hyperopia on overall but uh, for young people a mild induction of hyperopia is just like a slightly overcorrected refractive procedure and that doesn't at least initially create too much of a problem uh, with regards to the biomechanical assessment that would be very tough uh, both the corvus and the ora require uh, a fairly good uh, corneal surface to even take uh, take readings yeah and uh, Uh, so, uh, but uh, yeah, I agree. If the flap, if the corneal residual corneal bed is going to be very thin, then some form of augmentation will have to be done. Yeah, yeah Rajesh, that the thickness of the flap uh, does the amount of hyperopia that is induced does not correspond to the thickness of the flap that has been amputated. The hyperopia is always lesser induced is always lesser than uh, what is the what you can mathematically calculate uh, based on the flap thickness that has been removed. Ah, so, because it's a planar flap. It, the flap doesn't by itself take away the myopia. So, uh, other than the fact that there is more thickness being removed in the center of the flap than in the periphery of the flap, uh, that would be inducing the mild hyperopia. Otherwise, it wouldn't. Okay. Let me uh, go to the next. Uh... <clears throat> One thing I want to tell add: sure. it is better, is always better to apply bandage for that lesion. Go. Every flap disposure that will prevent the flap displacement and micro stria in the immediate post op and the and mostly mostly prevent the epithelial growth also in the long term for twenty four hours only. Okay, but uh, we uh, in fact don't practice uh, contact lens elastic patients because uh, their recovery in terms of a pain which is there for a first you know half an hour uh, they may have little watering pain if that time is covered then uh, they have a very little chance of a flap uh, problems it is only you know some patient they are very uncomfortable they might rub their eyes in the uh, when they go to sleep without realizing that you know they are without the glasses now and uh, normally whatever case we have seen is uh, after trauma only the trauma so i i think uh, apart from contact lens in uh, difficult cases we would definitely like to advise these people to use uh, some sort of uh, you know protective glasses or a goggles when they go out in especially in crowded places traveling in a uh, you know metros or the areas it is going to definitely protect because these flaps can get dislodge in the minor trauma also so that is a uh, one instruction uh, we should keep like i talked about uv protecting glasses for prk patients yeah raji sir uh, what would be your indication to suture a flap back and when what all are the indications because i recently had a discussion with one of the refractive surgeons where it is after surgery i didn't see the patient it was all telephonic the, the flap had dislocated on, even after three attempts so i actually advise that you go ahead and suture the flap with tenon nylon but what would be what are the other indications apart from things like this yeah rajiv fortunately i have had no chance of a suturing any flap till date but uh, there are situation where suturing may be required especially free cap which happens where i think you may require to put a you know a sutures but nowadays uh, people have you know various uh, glues which can be applied uh, which we didn't have in our time earlier so you can just simply use a fibrin glue in these cases to attach the free cap uh, also but yes uh, uh, we have a recommendation for a, when you are doing a flap lifting for a cases where you have a epithelial ingrowth which has been multiple and you feel there's a track which is there in these cases or your flap opposition is not appropriate in one particular quadrant or like a case i showed with which had a you know sort of a little bit of post traumatic dislodgement and you want to retain the flap in those cases you might put suture uh, in these cases suture has to be not only that area of concern you have to suture in, in you know almost four directions so that you, you know, the forces distribute to all uh, 360 degrees so it is sometimes mistake to put a you know one or two suture in that particular area which you feel track and that is as such causes a fold and creates another you know track for these cases so you have to tighten your suture uh, nicely so that you make sure flap is well opposed 
if you have an anti-segment OCT, you can take the patient and see if uh, there's a, you know, still a space left uh, when you put a suture in these cases. I think the best person will be Dr. Namrata Sharma because she has the you know videos of a large number of uh, complication post LASIK. I think uh, all the flaps which are edematous, if they are edematous, then you need to suture because they will not oppose. And like sir very nicely highlighted, if you feel there's going to be a conduit from any side, then those are the flaps which have to be again sutured. Free caps, we've gotten away with just putting the bandage uh, contact lens also, but sometimes they do shrink in size if the free caps are of thickness, which are desperate, well, not of uniform thickness. Then again, you would have to, you know, suture them. So we've had two free caps, uh, which both of us, we didn't have to suture. But yes, I remember there was a very large epithelial growth, uh, which when taken out, uh, and especially if the refractive error has been high preoperatively and you've ablated a lot of area, so the flap tends to have a sort of a tenting effect because the ablation has been much greater for high myope especially, which we used to do in the olden times. And there you will have a conduit which will be left because the, both the curvatures are not going to match when you try to oppose them. So those are the instances uh, where suturing would be required. In fact, I've seen a video shown by, uh, I, don't, I don't remember that person, where subsequently, next day, the cap was attached to the contact lens only. So, <laughs> I think those are cases you may have to rightly point it out. Suturing may be required in such cases, especially your free cap is irregular sometimes, may not be a very smooth uh, as you desire. And sometimes by searching free cap also, you can damage uh, it may be in, into the microkeratome as such. Okay, let me briefly go into the next generation uh, surgery. That is a uh, uh, small incision lenticular extraction. As I told in the beginning, uh, approved by FDA in 2016. And very soon we're going to have uh, hyperopic uh, approval also. And classically, what we uh, talk about is uh, Lesser, lesser, you know, adverse effect onto ocular surface. That is important because most uh, corneal ablative procedures will going to change the surface of a cornea. Let it be LASIK or a PRK, and lesser incidence of dry eye. And uh, people talk about uh, all three procedures: surface ablation, LASIK, uh, flap based, or uh, smile. They have a different uh, genetics of healing, which uh, Dr. Rohit Shetty talks about. So I also feel it may be different in these cases. And the biomechanical stent may be better than LASIK in these cases. This is a system we have currently available uh, world over. Very soon, I'm pretty sure other companies will come up and the machine uh, will look better, smaller, and the prices will also come down. I think Jais already had a modified their system. They, instead of having a single uh, apparatus now, they can get two uh, divisions. One is a, opt, uh, you can say, operative device. Other one will be the uh, laser device. Today, we have to move the bed of a patient. When the patient lies down here, then shift here. Subsequently, only this laser head will come up over the patient's eye. The patient doesn't have to move. Uh, the system will move and the laser ablation uh, to create the uh, lenticule is much faster than what we have. Uh, now uh, we take around 28 uh, seconds now, that will be half of that in near future. Treatment pack is important for a smile, it's been selection wise, depending on the white to white and the ethnicity of uh, patients. We normally use a small uh, size because these are a uh, uh, going to you know sort of apinate the cornea. It just aggravates the you know corneal surface rather than having a limbal suction, which is seen in the case of the exam laser. And uh, because the generation of uh, nerves, because you cut lesser nerves in these cases, so it's much faster. And uh, refractive uh, corrections, which will be done for a patient, will have a lesser chance of the damage and better recovery of the surface. By this I talked about, I'll just go to the surgical technique. Uh, we have uh, basically three steps, docking, laser uh, application to create the refractive uh, lenticule, then shift the patient 
gets into a microscope where you have to physically, uh, surgically remove the uh, lenticule after doing the, uh, uh, these six steps, cap side opening, delineate the anterior uh, and posterior channels, then do a plain dissection, both anteriorly, then posteriorly, then extract the lenticule and inspect the lenticule and the center patient back. This is one of the first, uh, I think, uh, review article on a techniques uh, of SMILE published in uh, clinical ophthalmology. And this is a small video to show the, how we actually approach these patients. The first we do uh, spiral in, that is a posterior uh, lenticule uh, creation, then the side cut, then spiral out center to periphery for a cap uh, cut, uh, which is happening with the uh, femtosecond uh, 500 Hertz uh, Visumex machine. Then you have a side cut, sorry. Then you have a side cut happening in the case here. Then what we do here is important here. The first, uh, I go a little back here. So this is the uh, two lines which you can see very clearly here. The one is this outer line is for a cap. The inner line is circulates for a lenticule. So lenticule has to be taken out by dissecting first anteriorly, then posteriorly in the cases after opening the side cut. So this is a two millimeter side cut here. So I'm doing an anterior here. The, the circle is you know behind, underneath this dissector here. So that is the anterior dissection which is happening here. Now I'll go posterior dissection. You can gently go down and see create a posterior dissection here. So you can see a little pocket being created here. This I have called a meniscus uh, creation. So once you see the meniscus, you already uh, disturb the posterior part. So go a little sideways, make sure the circle is not visible. That means you're anterior to the uh, lenticule uh, anterior surface and posterior to the calf surface. Gently, smoothly uh, dissect out the entire area. So this can be difficult sometimes. Make sure your fulcrum doesn't go haywire for this. Otherwise, you'll have a side cut extension immediately. I'm going posteriorly now. First, I'll detach inferiorly, then detach two peripheral areas. So this is a three-segmental dissection first, then complete the entire dissection, then take out the lenticule. You can see I have done a 360-degree dissection very smoothly. Then take the flap all around to center. And then with the spatula itself, you can take it out uh, gently here. So this is a no touch technique which uh, we have been following. You can examine the surface, you can examine the lenticule. You do have a slit lamp also here. You can see the entire surface also. This is a immediate post-op uh, of a smile patient. You can still see under retroillumination the two cuts. These are visible uh, quite long, but if you see after a year or so, then it's not visible. Only thing which is visible is a scar, which will be seen in a minus 100, 100 degree uh, incision for all cases. One linear scar will be seen in these cases. This is OCT immediately, subsequently. Do have a little learning curve in these cases, especially for a cap lenticular dissection. Complication go down very, very fast. This is our learning curve of uh, 100 uh, eyes, 50 cases. And we do did see a lot of uh, problems like a uh, side cut extension happening or epithelial defect creation because you're not in the proper depth. OBL formation can you know, make sure that you're not seeing very clearly. There we take, you have to take out these bubbles so that visibility improves. And most uh, dreaded thing uh, was the suction loss happening in these cases because the appellation uh, pressure is so low, around 35 millimeter mercury. So if patient is uncomfortable, you can have a suction loss happening in these cases. So this is what uh, people find difficulty sometime uh, in terms of a the lenticule getting attached to the cap. So this is the right way to approach. First, we dissect anteriorly, then go posteriorly. But sometimes, because we are not aware of how thick is the lenticule, because we think uh, 50 microns, 100 microns will be you know, thick, but they are very thin lenticule. So you struggle to see the posterior plane, though you have dissected anteriorly correctly. And that process damage the stroma here. So this is the scenario of going posteriorly first, without realizing you are posteriorly, then you look for again posteriorly, still damage the stroma in these cases. So once you have this uh, lenticule, which is attached to the cap, following complication can occur. Most importantly, a cap tear, if it is in the middle, it can go up to the pupillary axis and can induce uh, a higher operation in these cases. Epithelial defect uh, can come up. 
and uh, edema which in develop if you prolong your surgical procedure the subsequent visibility also becomes very difficult so if you have this two separation anteriorly in one side and the posteriorly in one side then you have a two separate areas if i dissected anteriorly then i'm going posteriorly i can just nudge it and create the you know uh, small uh, meniscus here or if you're done anterior, you're going posterior, you're going to have a little bit of a resistance uh, to meet these two. That means you are in two different planes. So that is important uh, way to look into. And this uh, meniscus anterior to the dissection plane tells you you are in a posterior plane correctly and makes things very, very easy subsequently. And this uh, is uh, can be appreciated by anti-segment OCT. This was my first case uh, where I struggled to get into a posterior plane. So I had to do anti-second OCT, I realized it is adherent to the uh, you know, cap lenticule. And I had already damaged the stroma looking for a posterior plane. This is what uh, in the initial stage we do uh, in some cases. Then I uh, we described the Sinsky technique uh, to nudge out the flap. Now you can do it the, the, the routine dissector also and could complete surgery subsequently. So this is what uh, we do subsequently. And I can see here, we are dissecting the uh, plane and then subsequently struggle to see the posterior. I, I'm, I'm thinking I'm doing anterior dissection here. Then subsequently trying to do a posterior dissection, which is uh, not there. And this is what happens. Like you are always in a one space. So single space means either the lenticule is anteriorly or posteriorly, either way. So that can be uh, diagnosed with the, you know, the meniscus sign. You can see the meniscus is visible here. The mistake was I had gone posteriorly directly. So this is a meniscus I've created. I missed out that. So that is what is difficult. So I'll nudge out this uh, flap, uh, cap, which is attached, uh, lenticular attached to the cap. And this has to be brought up to the center, this nudging. You don't leave it here. So once you're in the center, you can go just anterior to that and dissect out. So this is what I do sometimes now. I go directly posteriorly first, then do this nudging out in case and do a po posterior to anterior dissection. Subsequently, dissection can be completed. If you want to do a, a rexis type of procedure, then you have to create, uh, create a two meniscus either side, then hold this and tear it out uh, nicely. People describe this uh, rexis, uh, uh, lenticular uh, rexis happening in these cases. Section loss incidence, uh, goes very less once you experience. I had around uh, three or four uh, section losses that, that happened in a initial uh, cases only. And otherwise, very rare to have a section uh, happening. So mainly surgeon inexperience or patients are uh, uncooperative you know, because of a very anxious patient, uh, especially after the light goes off, uh, fixation lies. And that normally happens uh, during the lenticular uh, creation. And uh, this was a video uh, uh, I'll just go a little faster here. We have uh, presented this in American Academy. So this is a soft docking, uh, as I talked about, the pressure is around 35 millimeter mercury. The patient moves the eye, you can have this uh, suction uh, getting lost at this time also. And uh, you can be there in various uh, types. So this is the uh, uh, first case where uh, we had uh, Suction loss happening right in the beginning. You can see here the, the conjunctiva is visible here. So once you have a visibility conjunctiva, that means the patient is moving the eye, and you can have uh, loss happening very very uh, soon. So never go ahead if you see this type of uh, conjunctiva getting into the appellation and the cornea. This is bound to uh, lose the suction very soon. So if this has, so you have to redo it immediately. So this this is a very important learning. This was one of the first cases I had done to, and uh, we had to redo it. You can redo immediately and make sure a patient is uh, counseled, make, make him comfortable. You can redo it immediately. The surgery is over. So this is the second case where section loss happened uh, you know, after initiation of cap cut, uh, which has gone beyond a 10%. If you, if you are a uh, lenticle cut, is initiated, goes beyond 10%, then things are very difficult. You can see, again, the conjunctiva here, the fluid was there. So this case, I can't, can't redo it. It has to be postponed. I did a subsequently flap procedure in this particular case after uh, eight weeks or three months subsequently. 
this is another case where suction loss happened after completion of my lenticule cut. So this is the easy because I can re-dock it and make a flap. I'll dry my uh, appellation cone. So this gives me an idea for centration because the lenticule cut was complete up to side cut. I'm making a flap again. This will center to periphery. In fact, the machine tells you what is to be done. That's a good part in a uh, Visumex uh, system. And surgery was completed subsequently. The outcomes are uh, not bad, uh, even after uh, uh, re-surgeries or uh, in initially uh, docking immediately also with suction loss. These are uh, questions which comes in a smile procedure. If you have to redo it, uh, what are your options and what are the causes for that? Mainly it is under correction uh, in these cases, regression in a higher degree of corrections. And the procedure which you have is you can do PRK, you can do a thin flap, elastic, uh, if you have initially taken the thicker cap, or you can do a circle pattern where you make a cap into flap. And this is the uh, uh, case uh, scenario, which has changed the, you know, uh, cases of the suction loss happening in a, uh, some cases you can immediately do a, a circle pattern in these cases. We are looking for a, a sub cap lenticular extraction that is doing a re-smile in these cases, which may be the, you know, future way of taking. This is the algorithm we, I look into if your cap thickness is 100 to 110 microns and a patient has, you know, contact sports uh, and interface haze, residual well thickness, these three things have to be checked. Then subsequently you can design. If there's an interface haze and uh, you do have adequate uh, uh, residual bed thickness, the best would be a circle pattern in these cases and in today's time. If you have a no interface haze, patient has a contact sports or a profession, you have a little borderline uh, bed thickness. PRK is the best option in these cases with mitomycin C. Because the haze in these cases, it's not like a primary PRK. So you have more chance of haze in a post-smile patient also. But if you have a thicker cap, you've gone for around 140 micron thickness in your cases. And if there's no interface haze, you can think of a thin flap plastic in these cases. Because then you'll avoid the uh, haze coming up, coming up in these cases. Only thing you can initiate the flap related complication might happen in these cases. But uh, if there's a haze, you have a, other problems, the circle pattern is based, based in these cases. But PRK again can be done in these cases. In fact, if you look into literature, maximum number of procedures are PRK in a post residual refractive error and post smile in these cases. If you have a less than 1.5 or a less than 2 diopter uh, to be corrected. But if you have a haze in these cases, which may happen in uh, some cases, then circle pattern is the best procedure in these cases. Yes, I'll just skip. Uh, this is what uh, I talked about. This is the initial, uh, you can say, uh, area of concern. We make another uh, lamellar ring to make it a flap. And the hinge has to be just opposite to the initial side cut you have done it. So in fact, we are making the you know same uh, area of uh, initial uh, flap uh, posterior interface connecting with this lamellar ring to make a, you know, a D shaped pattern in this case. Outcomes uh, in a post uh, smile uh, retreatment is also quite uh, convincing and quite good. In fact, uh, now people have uh, answers to all types of procedures. In uh, my practice of smile uh, for last now, almost touching four years, uh, we have to do an enhancement in any patient. So that shows that uh, it is very, very effective procedure as such. The outcome, if you compare a smile with femtosecond LASIK is quite good. Femtosecond LASIK might have an advantage in the first 24 hours if you are correcting more than four diopters of myopia, uh, less than four diopters of myopia. But if you look at higher, higher degree of correction, smile outweighs uh, LASIK in terms of a lesser induction of a higher order abrasion. The long-term results of dry eye, we all know, is better with a smile as compared to a LASIK in all regards. If you look into a confocal microscopy, sub basal nerve density is much better. And that comes up very fast within the first few months also. And all other scores are better with the smile procedures. These are all meta-analysis that we're talking about. Quality of uh, vision and quality of life, both are better with a smile procedure. So just to summarize, before we have a discussion on a, a smile, all modern day laser procedures in a cornea tend to give a excellent uh, outcomes in terms of predictability, safety, and the quality of vision and quality of life. 
pre-op assessment, which has been the major concern in uh, pre, uh, you know, uh, this century, in 90s, we didn't have a good uh, way to check the cornea and its biomechanics. Now things have improved uh, to exclude the high risk cases. Definitely the outcomes are going to be better. Had a ablation induction wise smile at this point is better, but uh, it needs to be compared with the newer uh, procedures people talk about uh, uh, contour vision that is a topo guided uh, treatment or a uh, PRK which is uh, not going to make a flap. The flap is totally out outweighted, but smile it is is still considered to be better at this stage. We need to see what is going to be future with the laser ability procedure. Thank you for your kind listening, and uh, we can have a discussion now. That was a wonderful, yes, talk, wonderful talk, sir. Uh, really a grand masterclass, I must say. Uh, thank you. It was uh, an honor for all of us. Sir, uh, about the lenticule extraction during SMILE, do you think there is any role of using tri diluted uh, triamcinolone acetate or uh, hydrating the flap with saline, especially if you have a part of a lenticule left behind which you can't visualize? No, Rajiv, uh, with you know, surgical uh, experience, uh, things have become very, very simple uh, in terms of uh, delineating the lenticule. Both anterior and posterior dissection become very simple now. We know how it is done because there, there's no way people would give you those uh, small tips, which uh, you know, we have given in our uh, book. All the videos are there, people can see. Now we have so many videos in our YouTube now, it gives a lot of points. But you're right, uh, you can have a very difficult time sometimes, especially if your lenticule extension was not complete. You're left with the you know, uh, residual you know, uh, lenticule there. To delineate that, yes, there are various ways uh, which has been described. One is uh, using a transinolone, which may delineate the retained lenticule. Or you can, uh, hydration, not a good idea. Because if you hydrate the lenticule, you're going to hydrate the uh, cap also. Once the cap gets hydrated, you can't see anything. So it is the interface which has to be highlighted. In fact, uh, no, initial, uh, I couldn't publish that. I had done a uh, experimental, I know, uh, in a goat side, in the lenticule uh, delineation with uh, fluorescein. And it was wonderful to uh, see that. But fluorescein intrastomally in a human eye, I'm not sure how it is going to effect. But subsequently, Dr. Mahipal group highlighted transinolone. Maybe it's a good idea. But other area is if you, have, if you see uh, without causing the edema of, uh, of the cap, you can use a you know, slit lamp there because slit lamp is attached with this microscope. You can appreciate that also. The only thing you have to do is you have to dilate the pupil and see retroillumination coming up. You can see very easily. Or shift the patient to main OR, dilate the pupil, and things are beautifully visible. And that can be done. But I, had, I, I don't have experience because I didn't have a, this uh, complication. Less not to have them, sir. Ah. <laughs> but the, these two things I have learned. One is a retro mission, which gives a immediately a pickup. Second is time slowdown, which I have yet to use. But I'm not sure those uh, particles, if they're going to you know, come out uh, effectively out, or they're going to create some uh, healing uh, differences in, a, in, in the interface in these cases. Uh, if you're very difficult, don't do anything at this stage. Wait for a, a few weeks, then make a you know, flap-based procedure, circle pattern, make a flap and take out this difficult landing which is attached that can be removed and uh, effectively done very effectively also. Sir, if you're contemplating doing a circle pattern later on, maybe about three months later for some reason, is it more difficult to lift the flap as compared to a microkeratoma of femtosecond laser flap? Not at all. It's very easy. I've done uh, one case where I, I had a suction loss in the first uh, no, 10% of uh, my this thing. And it was very simple. Only thing you have to make sure you uh, measure your thickness appropriately before you plant this. Because your calf thickness would have changed. So you have to have a very nice anti-second OCT. Again, you have to plan as you have done earlier. Suppose I have gone for 120 uh, uh, cap thickness, I'll go 120, I'll be in the right plane most of the time. Unless your cap thickness has changed subsequently in a poster period with more than at least 15 microns. If it's less than 15 microns change the thickness, doesn't matter. Because epithelial is the major concern in these cases. And all post-op difficult cases, uh, we normally don't see, but epithelial thickness has to be measured appropriately. 
because that will make a difference of you know uh, more than a you know 15 20 micron sometimes so anything from the panelists uh, they want to ask dr rishi is always with full of questions uh, are anything you have any experience of seeing the acacia in case of a smite uh, uh there has been a i think very few reports of ectasia post smile and that i attribute to a, a very good uh, clinical uh, pre op assessment of our cases in today's scenario if you if i compare my lasik and smile they'll have a similar incidence of ectasia happening i'm pretty sure because uh, it's not going to make a huge difference uh, in terms of our ectasia development but our screening programs has improved so much now in last 5 to 10 years the ectasia incidence has gone down so i'll not put uh, you know blame to a procedure it is the uh, awareness of uh, excluding the preclinical uh, ectasia of our cases but so, as we have you know more cases more people doing smile definitely there will be cases with uh, ectasia coming up also because And in this even, case uh, rbt sorry sorry yeah. now we this have case, uh, <coughs> sorry sorry yeah go ahead And because in the most of cases of smile rbt is much lesser than the what the tap does for you that's why i'm ask i ask people say you can go up to 250 microns in smile that is a you know uh, people thought but as far as we are concerned we don't go beyond less than 300 microns so there is a standard for lasik and standard for smile also okay. so not compromise thinking that you are doing smile procedure it's not true the indications the amount of tissue uh, which is being removed is similar in uh, lasik and smile the only thing you have a retained cap here and there is a flap that's the difference so the message is that uh, we should have similar kind of a screening procedure and yes yes absolutely type of exclusion criteria for both smile and lasik however there are certain advantages with the cap that is there dr mohak would you like to say something Yes, sir. So as you as you rightly say, sir, the one about the comparison between the smile and the contour of visa, because nowadays these are the two procedures which are most of the patients are confused. So I'd like to have your personal view. But personally, I feel smile is quite better compared to the contour of visa, just because it doesn't have any flap. And second thing, I wanted to know regarding the biomechanical stability of the smile, whether it is better than the LASIK or it is as good as the LASIK. no first uh, answer to first question uh, i think it is not uh, appropriate to really compare a smile with contour vision first of all because they are two different uh, procedures as such i would like to compare my contour vision to my uh, standard you know uh, wave front uh, lasik because that, these are similar procedure and to look into advantage of uh, doing a topo guided ablation to a standard you know uh, aspheric profile which we are doing and uh, yet uh, yet i have to see the advantage of contura in all cases and there are limit limitations if i have 100 patients of lasik who demand a contura vision i will be only be able to do a contura vision in a 40% of cases next 60% of cases i can't do contura because the image capturing is very uh, difficult to have a good analysis second is the uh, manifest refraction and the uh, topo topo refraction doesn't allow you to do a contura vision in some cases because your cylinder axis and amount of cylinder is so different that means you are having the uh, some sort of uh, either the posterior part of cornea or a lenticular uh, refraction is coming into that so if you have uh, other algorithm which is uh, going to come very soon which takes into account your total refraction that is a wave front as well as the lenticular and the posterior corneal uh, refraction then this surface uh, uh, contour type or a topo guided ablation may be effective in these case in a larger number of cases today it is uh, not 100% which is not possible at all So that is a difference. Smile, I can do in hundred percent of cases, and there the uh, important thing is uh, if you are doing only the spherical treatment, you know that there is no transition zone in a smile. So you are not really making a huge difference in terms of making center to periphery in these cases, unless you are treating the you know compound uh, ast astigmatism. Doctor Rishi, if uh, wanted to ask a question. Uh. 
Uh, no, my question, in fact, it was more of a comment rather than a question. And I think Jeevan uh, very nicely answered it. That you can't really compare Contura and Smile. Contura is, a, is an ablation uh, algorithm, whereas Smile is just a completely different technique. Uh, the thing that I wanted to actually say was uh, what each one of these techniques has actually done is to bring in newer sets of adjustments and newer sets of complications, which yeah. corneal <laughs> surgeons have now had to deal with. And that has been the real challenge. And uh, it's not just the economics, which has uh, somehow curtailed each one of us to go from one procedure to the other, because it's not easy to every few years invest in a brand new technology, which costs cross. Uh, but I think uh, also uh, the, uh, the, the complications that one develops and the learning curve uh, that is associated with any new technology uh, does work like a bit of a uh, you know, uh, a negative as far as adopting these are concerned. But I'm curious to know about uh, the hyperopic uh, profiles uh, that are coming up in uh, which Dr. Tityal was referring to. So if you could give us some uh, uh, foresight into that, that would be useful. And what kind of paths are we looking at that would be immediately be available? You know, uh, Rishi, I have no uh, direct uh, experience of uh, hyperopic lenticule creation. And uh, I've also heard from our experts who are into this uh, trial, which uh, I think in the, the Netra Dham people are a part of this uh, trial of uh, hyperopic things. And which I think I Mahipal's was, group is also doing uh, hyperopic trials, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe, I'm not sure, because initial, uh, the part of a study is, you know, uh, Jai's people have included Netra Dham. But uh, it is a larger lenticule. And the profile of lenticule is different than a myopic lenticule. So the extraction of a lenticule is going to be very tough in these cases. So you have to have a much bigger learning curve for a hyperopic. In fact, uh, what Zai's people have uh, told us, if you have done more than 200 uh, smile, myopic smile, then you will be allowed to uh, jump into hyperopic uh, surgery. So that uh, is the uh, cutoff uh, so you need to have an experienced uh, surgeon to handle this because uh, and the cone size is going to be larger because you are going to be a peripheral. Mm -hmm. So Indian eyes, I'm not sure you can have a higher chance of suction loss happening in these cases because you're going to use a larger cone. So that is another consideration which we have to see. Otherwise, uh, uh, results wise, whatever results have come, uh, there is, seems to be quite satisfactory. But uh, I'm not sure if they're going to go for a higher uh, hyperopic now. It's a moderate, uh, low to moderate hyperopia which they are looking into. Once you mention it, sir, it, uh, now it comes to a mind because the lenticle would be thinner in the center and much thicker in the periphery. So handling it would yeah. be a uh, big, big... Uh, it's very difficult. That people don't realize. They think like a myopic lenticule. It's not that. There's going to be a different thickness. Absolutely. And that the section has to be much better in these cases. Yeah, and but I, I'm hopeful with the newer generation system they are coming out because the uh, lenticle creation is going to be faster and laser uh, spot size also they have changed. The distance and the energy is also changed in these cases to have a faster ab uh, you know, ablation. And what about the cyclo rotation between smile? How do you That's, that's going to come in a new system. It's, okay. it's all now coming in the newer system. Is there any that's going to be, for that's going to be only be used for a if patient has a cylindrical component. Yes. Okay. So, uh, any other questions that the panelists might have? Uh, so, biomechanical strength wise, whether smile is better or LASIK is better, or both are equal. Biomechanical strength wise. Ah, okay. Initially, yeah. 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 Whatever uh, the results uh, we have gone through, people have published. They've all said uh, smile has a better bi biomechanical strength if you measure by, you know, Corvus or aura. But its ultimate effect onto the cornea, how do we uh, assess? You have a better biomechanical strength that should ultimately boil down to a better refractive stability in long term and lesser chances of uh, uh, weak weakening cornea uh, result that is ectasia. So that has to, you know, prove... Uh, by a longer long-term studies, which we don't have now. So it be difficult to say if, if you have, you know, you have 100 kg uh, strength or a 70 kg strength, 
but ultimately that has to boil down to a outcome wise that we don't have prk yes the studies uh, uh, that uh, we have gone through the entire uh, literature uh, we analyzed the uh, net meta analysis in that prk is number 1 because it definitely has a better megalistan than smile than lasik lasik also femtosecond lasik than microcatom lasik that, that is the uh, sequence but ultimately how it boils down to a you know a long term result that has to be the major concern so what about those extra procedures the people are recommending prk extra lasik extra smile extra do they really work or just are the gimmicks sir the the one publication which uh, by you know uh, dr sri ganes at all where they found that uh, uh, smile extra was beneficial if they had a two groups normal cornea and the you know thinner corneas and they found that it is it was definitely effective uh, when you do a uh, extra because they had uh, some patient the uh, showing the ectasia in their cases where they did, didn't use the extra in that way it may be effective but what about the refractive ways it may be effective for uh, you know not letting ectasia happen but you are changing the entire healing process of your cornea with the laser which you have used and i'm not sure uh, in long term is the refractive stability going to be similar you have seen cross linking the cornea what happens you know the cornea gets flatter flatter and flatter in keratoconus if i see my keratoconus at 3 months 6 months 1 year of uh, cross linking the cornea gets flatter is going flatter even up to 3 think- years yeah so the same thing going to happen with the these uh, refractive but only difference is the cornea is one is uh, you can see a diseased cornea this is a normal cornea so maybe that difference would be there but that has to be proven i personally i am not in great favor of using you know extra procedures so i think uh, that's oh. a very very good point and i think mohak raised the very uh, vital question is the whole uh, fundamental ideology of uh, doing a thinning procedure in an otherwise a thin cornea or a diseased cornea or a biomechanically weak cornea i fundamentally wouldn't subscribe to any further thinning procedure i mean i first want to thin it and then i want to strengthen it uh, so i, I uh, personally I, and and that's one reason i don't like extra procedures also it brings in a fair degree of unpredictability to your outcomes because you don't that's know right. what the cross linking is going to do to the refractive outcome and uh, you cannot titrate the amount of flattening that you're going to get out of the uh, out of the refractive procedure especially when it's being done intrastromally and you're not actually uh, doing it uh, you know super, you're doing all the uh, riboflavin injection internally so i think that answers uh, yeah. hopefully shed some light on that debate so uh, if there are uh, no further questions i'll request the actually point. one thing more actually is also difficult because if you are planning lasik extra so how much cylinder should be corrected before we do the extra because it will become completely unpredictable yes yes so there are you know various thoughts on that uh, some people correct half the cylinder some people will correct three quarters of the cylinder but there is no real algorithm which can give you uh, one just has to work by one's own experience and in the end uh, how many such patients do you actually really do I, i'm sure they are not in the hundreds we have done lot of cases but a very uh, cylinder correction post op was very unpredictable very unpredictable yes that's i think the experience of all of us who have the done the patient it. always complain ki you have done this post you have taken extra money for us and the same time again i have to wear the glasses for cylindrical power that is a problem yes very yeah. true so uh if i may like uh, if there are no more questions i'd like to con- bring this session to a excellent session to a closure i'll request dr rishi to give his final comments before i close the session uh thanks rajiv i think uh, i've had a wonderful uh, evening listening to professor titial giving us all these insights and having wonderful uh, comments and contributions uh, both from dr anjum and uh, dr mohak and uh, the uh, discussion with uh, rajesh namrata and uh, rajiv so uh, uh i think the points that uh, dr titial has mentioned and the thing that stands out is refractive surgery uh, in the current form uh, started uh, almost two decades ago and it has remained all the three generations are still available so prk lasik lasik uh, 
lasik with uh, a keratome lasik with uh, uh, you know the bladeless with the femto and now with smile and now the variations coming through are still all being used so obviously there is uh, uh, there there are still terrific procedures and one has to have access to all of them as well have have a very clear cut idea of what would work best for which particular patient uh, and that comes with a great deal of experience so i think uh, what dr tityal has given us is a wonderful evolution and i think he has uh, evolved uh, along with the evolution of these techniques and his uh, outcomes and his results and his publications are uh, you know they are they are excellent uh, uh, indicator of of the kind of work he has done so i'm very grateful to him and he is the president of the keratorefractive refractive surgery society and so that is a fitting fitting tribute uh, so thank you very much and uh, i see rajesh is is back on and uh, so um, i would uh, hand you back to rajesh and rajiv so that was a um, actually, so, sorry i am having a bad uh, food poisoning so that's why <laughs> i i had gone for i had watery diarrhea and then okay 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 now i had vomiting actually oh so, my god came back so in the end i would like to thank uh, tell sir for an excellent lecture and uh, uh, i mean we have all learned everything uh, about refractive surgery from him so <clears throat> once again it was a complete revision i would like to thank my co moderator rajiv who, and dr rishi who, who who have you know anchored during these times i had sent a message that uh, i will not be available in between uh thanks a lot uh, for supporting me every time always all the time and big thanks to our panelists dr uh, anjum who is uh, uh, you know uh, uh, you may not be knowing but he has worked in various places and has uh, loads of uh, you know experience of refractive surgery and of course mohak has already created a record of number of refractive surgeons so the and of course dr namrata and dr ambrish darak who are again veterans in the field of refractive surgery so i thought that you know uh, these were the most apt panelists for this kind of a, a talk so a big thanks to all of them uh, thanks to uh, the support team of ipca who have supported our webinars i would like to thank bageshwar because he is the pillar he is a pillar of strength of uh, you know we people working in iskara so he is always there whenever i ask him to do it is done immediately of course anil also keeps logging and keeps working hard so a big thanks to all of you a big thanks to all the listeners all the viewers and uh, uh, at this point of time i would like to say bye to all of you good yeah. night rajiv would like to say something we'll be back next week again and the week next <laughs> week after that yes we're going to yes. bring better uh, even 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 uh, wonderful sessions after this time and again definitely yeah, we will you. be back next friday again for another topic another session and uh, thank you very thank, much thank you rajesh uh, holding on uh, despite of uh, bad uh, timing i think the your selected panelist uh, terrifically uh, you can say uh, pin pointed them in a right way we yeah. had a very nice discussion because experience makes a lot of difference you know we look for a practical uh, points theoretical people can go through read uh, if you have some practical tip even a one tip uh, in one session will make a difference for the person who are listening to us thank you all of you for making this a very lively session yeah. definitely will uh, wish and uh, hope that we'll have a much more uh, such you know discussion induced uh, inducing uh, sessions in future and a big thanks to ipca and especially mr iftiar who is the country head of ipca so thank yeah, you thank you thanks thank thanks to them thank you sir thank you sir and everybody thank okay. you thank, thank you, thank you. take care and uh, good night good night and see you all very soon thank you uh, admin are we offline yes sir admin no sir can, can we go offline Sure